Hey there, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani, and today's video is going to be on blood sugar, how to measure your blood sugar. Why is it even important? Again, regulating blood sugar can either be something done by managing stress and diet or lifestyle, or if we don't do these things, it's putting more stress on our hormones, more stress on our body, uh, creating imbalances and inflammation, and causing serious dysregulation in hormones. So let's dig in deeper. Lab tests. So how can we? How do we know your blood sugar is on track? So typically, a fasting glucose anywhere between mm, I'd say 70 to 75 to about 95 is a good place for your blood sugar to be. If your blood sugar gets too low, what actually happens is your adrenals make more adrenaline to bring that blood sugar back up because the body doesn't like the blood sugar going too low. And if you go too high, you go into this state of insulin resistance where your body's pumping out extra insulin to bring that blood sugar from the blood into the cell. So it's kind of the Goldilocks effects, not too high, not too low. Now with fasting blood sugar, right, we can also be in a state of what's known as ketosis where we're running more off of, off of our um, ketones, which are fat, fat byproducts that are used for fuel instead of sugar. Now this is great, this is really good, but again, being in ketosis all the time for some people may put too much stress on the adrenal glands because a process known as gluconeogenesis where we're converting essentially glucose from protein involves cortisol. So if we have some stressed out cortisol adrenal systems going on, we may not be able to run gluconeogenesis optimal. And I find a lot of patients that have, they're in ketosis for a long period of time, again, a good amount, they actually do better upping their carbs just a bit. Maybe their carbs are around 20 or 30, even 40. They may have some hair falling out, cold hands, cold feet, some adrenal fatigue or thyroid symptoms. We up the carbs just a bit and they feel better. So clinically there's something to this, whether or not we can find research into it. I know clinically that some people, when they're in ketosis too long, it does put some stress on some of the blood sugar and adrenal thyroid systems and adding a little bit of carbs in does make a big difference. We see it with dry eyes, we see it with sleep, we see it with hair loss, cold hands, cold feet. So again, not everyone. My default approach is always to a lower carbohydrate, nutrient dense, low toxin diet. And I, fi I find people should always find their carbohydrate threshold from there. Mine typically stays between 50 to 100 and I cycle carbs up and down, kind of a cyclical ketogenic, if you will. So fasting glucose between, six, uh, I'd say 70, 75, to 95. Again, low blood sugar can be a stress on the body. Also, blood sugar swings, going from high to low, that's called reactive hypoglycemia. That's also a big stress on the body too. Next is hemoglobin A1C. So anywhere between the low fours, uh, sorry, upper fours to low to mid fives is acceptable. Again, once you go over 5.6, 5.7, you get into the danger zone. I don't put too much stock in the hemoglobin A1C anymore because as your red blood cells live longer, they can accumulate more blood sugar. So your hemoglobin A1C is a marker based off of a 90 day shelf life of your red blood cell. If your red blood cell lives longer, it can accumulate more sugar on that A1C part of the hemoglobin and we may see a higher number. So I don't wanna to put too much stock into it because I see people with elevated A1Cs that have perfect blood sugar levels, perfect insulin levels, uh, great weight, great health, and they still have ele slight elevations in their A1C. So it's not everything it's cracked up to be. Again, functional glucose tolerance is probably going to be your best test here. This is a test that's looking at how your body actually handles a real meal. So a typical glucose tolerance is at like a 75 to 100 um, gram drink of sugar and seeing how your body responds to it from a, a blood sugar perspective. The problem with it is most people aren't consuming pure sugar in that kind of form. They're actually consuming it in a meal form, right? Proteins, fats, and carbs, and whole foods. So we wanna look at it from a functional perspective. We can get a blood sugar meter like this. I think if you go to choicefreestyle.com, I'll put a link on screen, you can actually get one for free, which is pretty cool. I have the Bayer Contour. I also have the one from Abbott as well. Uh, but really simply what you do is this. You get your strip out, you put your strip in the machine, just like so. Okay, turn the machine on. Now what you could do is you could actually measure it fasting. So first thing in the morning, kind of get a window of what your blood sugar is like before you eat anything. And ideally we want it you know, below 100, ideally mid, mid to low 90s at least would be a good place to be. Um, from there you pull back the little prong here and you can prick yourself in the finger, just like that. And then you can just milk it a little bit and you get a little bit of blood. And then you just put it right on the meter just like so. And then in five, four seconds, 
three, two, one, we'll get the blood sugar reading. And my blood sugar is actually 87. I ate about three hours ago. I even had two rows of dark chocolate, 89% dark chocolate. My blood sugar is at 87. That's a really good place to be. I like that blood sugar. Typically with a functional glucose tolerance, we like it to be within 140, so one hour after a meal. We like it less than 140. Two hours, we like it less than 120. And in three hours, we like it back below 100. Now myself, I personally like it never to go over 110, but based upon you know eating carbs and working out and certain levels of stress, it may go a little bit above 110, but I try to keep mine always below 110. That means that I'm not pumping out too much insulin to lower that blood sugar, and it also means I'm managing my stress and cortisol levels as well. So outside of that, mine was a 86 there, so pretty good, I'm kinda of happy with that. Trig to HDL ratio. So your triglycerides are basically excess carbohydrate. So a lot of your carbs, they go in, they get stored. If your body can't shuttle it into the muscle, it stores it as fat in the liver and it'll pump it out in the form of triglycerides as well. So if we have trigs, triglycerides for short, going above 100, that's definitely a concern. When we start to see the HDL ratio, the trig to HDL ratio going above two, so greater than two, I get concerned. So for instance, if we have trigs at 100 and HDL at 50, that's a two for a ratio. So as soon as we go above 100 on the trigs, that becomes greater than two, that's a problem. Okay, so triglycerides kind of give us a marker of how much extra carbs we're taking in because those extra carbs get converted to fat. That's something really hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around that sugar actually gets converted to fat. And a lot of people that may have high cholesterol, let's say their cholesterol is out of balance, right? Bad particle size, elevations in cholesterol in a, in a not so good way where the ratios are out of balance. Go see my previous video on that one. Um, a lot of times that's driven by either trans fats or a combination of trans fats, junk food, and all of the refined sugar, especially fructose. High fructose to be for sure on that. Fructosamine. Fructosamine is a great marker here to look at kind of a 10 day window for blood sugar. Typically the low, low 200s or so, somewhere right in the middle of the reference range. So low 200s is a pretty good marker for, for fructosamine. Because it's such a short term marker, I tend to go with the functional glucose tolerance over that because you can just do it, you know, um, right at home or, or while you're making a YouTube video like this. Um, next, fasting insulin. I think this is probably one of the most underrated markers that I, I very rarely see used. So we know that when you eat glucose or eat sugar or carbohydrates, right, it gets broken down to glucose, et cetera, that causes our body or our pancreas, right, to make insulin, it causes the um, cells of the pancreas, the, the beta cells, to make insulin, and that insulin pulls that sugar out of the bloodstream into the cells. High sugar in the bloodstream is very, very damaging. It causes glycation, which is creating all this free radical damage, so we wanna pull it out. So insulin's job is to go knock on the cell door and say, hey, we got some blood sugar here, let it in. And it just kind of escorts it into the, either the fat cell or the muscle. So when we have insulin that's too high, it's knocking on that door too much. It's just knocking on that door too much and the person entering just says, you know what, I'm done with you, I'm gonna ignore you. And then that blood sugar in that bloodstream starts getting higher and higher and higher. We have more glycation, more free radical damage, more oxidative stress. We start seeing little uh, capillary beds or, or micro capillaries in the eye become congested and we start seeing glaucoma and inflammation in the eyes. The, the nerves and the feet start becoming damaged. All of the sequelae of diabetic symptoms or pre-diabetic symptoms start happening. So insulin can be a great marker to look at. When I see anything greater than seven on a fasting insulin, I get a little concerned because we may have a good functional glucose tolerance, right? Let's say, let's say we're, our glucose is below 100, but we're having to pump out twice the amount of insulin to get there. That's concerning, because if I have a functional glucose tolerance test, let's say at 95, it looks okay, but my insulin levels fasting are around three or four or five, I'm good. But if someone's maintaining their, let's say their blood sugar at 95, but their insulin's get twice as high as mine when it's fasting, I get a little bit concerned about that. So we always wanna make sure fasting insulin's in check. Anytime it's greater than seven, I get a bit concerned that we're maybe making too much. 
And dysglycemia and insulin resistance is important. I already mentioned why. Insulin, when it's too high, it screws up your hormones. In men, it causes something known as aromatization, where your testosterone goes to estrogen. And in females, it's the opposite. It upregulates a compound called 1720 lyase that takes your estrogen and converts it into testosterone. So mother nature played this really, really cruel trick. When glucose and insulin go too high, women become men and men become women. I know, pretty crazy. Wrap your head around that. So we really want to watch our insulin levels. They screw up hormones. Google polycystic ovarian syndrome. First line therapy for PCOS is glucophage or metformin. And what metformin and glucophage does is helps with insulin sensitivity and it shuts down the gut from absorbing as much glucose and shuts down the liver from making gluconeogenesis, converting protein into sugar. So we know insulin, we know it really messes up our hormones, especially female hormones. If you got any sugar or any, um, any slight hairs, extra hair growth, peach fuzz on the jawline as a female, you know your testosterone's going uh, up and you may even have ovarian cysts as well. Uh, blood sugar and hormones, I kind of already alluded to that. The more our blood sugar swings like this, the more our blood sugar swings like this, I've done this diagram a couple of times here. You're gonna see here on the high side and on the low side, right? On the high side, we make a whole bunch of insulin. And on the low side, we make a whole bunch of cortisol and adrenaline. All right. Why are we making this on the low side? Because blood sugar is low. The body's like, what's going on? We got to bring that blood sugar back up. Boom. The pancreas, or I should say the adrenals come out and make a whole bunch of adrenaline and cortisol and the pancreas glucagon too. Blood sugar comes right back up. Body goes too high, right? Blood sugar needs to get into the cell. The cells are starving. All the sugar is out in the bloodstream. Boom. Pancreas comes in, shoots a whole bunch of insulin, and that brings the blood sugar back into the cell. So the cell is not starving. Right? This is why lots of people, lots of type 1 diabetics would, would die in their early um, 20s and even 30s before insulin was created in the mid-1950s is because of the fact that insulin allowed nutrients to go into the cell. Type 1 diabetics, just Google a picture of them in the early 1900s, you'd see them starving, looking emaciated, even though all the food's coming in, they couldn't get that, that sugar, that glucose into their cell. So it would literally just sit in their bloodstream, cause lots of damage, and they would literally starve. So insulin drives nutrients into the cell, right? So lab test markers, again, glucose tolerance, A1C, fasting glucose, insulin. These are all good things that your functional medicine doc can order on a conventional blood test or a functional medicine blood test, if you will. Dysglycemia and insulin disrupts your hormones. Blood sugar messes up your hormones. If you have PMS, adrenal fatigue, thyroid issue, you gotta look at your insulin, you gotta look at your blood sugar. There's no amount of thyroid hormone, there's no amount of supplements or adrenal programs or gut programs that are ever gonna fix blood sugar being a problem. So if you have an issue with any of these symptoms and you wanna reach out, click on screen, reach out to me, and I'll kinda help create a path for you to get your blood sugar back in balance. Again, this is Dr. J signing off. Have a great night.